So for the second learning module of chapter four, we'll look at how to compute the cross product using vector techniques. And oftentimes uh, this product is called the vector product because as we'll see in the next slide, contrary to the dot product, which we introduced in chapter three, that produced a scalar when you took the dot product to two vectors, this operation will actually produce a vector. And as you might imagine, kind of as foreshadowing, it will be useful to allow us to have kind of a uniform technique in order to compute the moments of forces. So uh, this is not only a, a concept that lives here in chapter four, it's lived previously when we talked about uh, kind of computing resultant force vectors. Whenever you use these geometrical approaches, they're nice because they have intuition to them, kind of like the uh, ideas that I brought up in the first learning module of this chapter. We're all familiar with using a wrench and wanting to get a bigger wrench, or we're all familiar with not knowing which way a door opens and pushing too close to the hinges and being like, hey, that was really tough and moving out away from the hinges in order to make it rotate more easily. However, uh, even though these geometrical techniques are good for intuition, they're not going to scale very well to complex problems, especially when we have uh, kind of textbook problems, where as we know from uh, chapter two and three, the geometries are often very hard to read. So it will be very nice to have a more generalized mathematical approach that uses the techniques from vector algebra or vector calculus, whatever you want to call it. So I'm sure that many of you are familiar with the cross product before, but as I mentioned beforehand, the kind of key point to realize initially is that when you take a cross product of two vectors, you get another vector. Where will that vector live? Well, we're familiar if we were to draw two vectors on a piece of paper, they naturally live in what we might call the XY plane. But I can take and rotate this any way I want in three dimensional space. So anytime I have two vectors, they're naturally going to define a plane. And the cross product uh, will be a new vector that is always perpendicular to that plane. It will either come out of the plane or into the plane. And how I determine whether or not it comes out or into the plane is known as the right hand rule. And that's what we see uh, going on in this figure. We have the cross of A and B. And if you notice what the individual has done is they've taken the base of the right hand, they've aligned it along the first vector, because as we'll see here in a minute, and it's probably obvious to you right now, the cross product is not commutative, meaning that the order matters. So take the base of your hand, align it on the first vector, and cross into the second vector. And the direction that your thumb points is the direction of the cross product. So in that case, right, the cross product would be the direction as shown. However, if I was trying to do B cross A, in order to put the base of my right hand with B and cross into A, my thumb will be pointing down in that case. So uh, the, the right hand rule really allows you to break the tie of whether that vector, which is perpendicular to the plane, comes out of the plane or goes into the plane. In terms of the underlying geometry, much like how the uh, dot or scalar product could be written as kind of the sum of the products of like components or mag A, mag B, cos theta, the cross product also has a geometric definition. What we notice is that as the magnitude of the two vectors becomes larger, the cross product becomes larger. That's probably a, a good uh, geometrical property for this operation. If you kind of think where we're going with computing moments and it being related to magnitude of forces and magnitude of distances. Uh, in addition, uh, we multiply by the sine of the planar angle that separates the two. So if you remember the way that the sine function works, if the sine function is at 90 degrees, it's at a maximum. If it's at zero or 180 degrees, it's at a minimum. And what that really tells us is that we're going to get strong cross products when the two planar vectors are pretty close to being orthogonal to one another. When they're pretty parallel to one another, we won't get a strong cross product. And if you think about it, that's totally opposite of a scalar product, which was measuring similarity to, between two vectors. And that's why that's related to the cosine of the angle in between. When we're taking a scalar product and we want to measure similarity, two vectors, vectors are similar when they're close together, when they're not separated by a lot. Since we'll see in a minute that what this is doing is allow us to uh, have a measure of torque, that's one of the applications of the cross product. Um, we're going to like perpendicular type geometries. So one thing that uh, you see from that uh, definition of the cross product that we presented previously, that geometrical definition, you can get some kind of easy rules of thumb for computing cross products of vectors, particularly, as I was just saying, if two vectors are going to um, be parallel, the cross product will be zero. And what that means is that the cross product of any vector with itself or a scaled version of itself will be zero. So that includes like the unit vectors, i cross i, zero, j cross a, j, zero, 5j cross j, still zero. Uh, in addition, if I take, just kind of using my right hand rule and that definition of magnitude, magnitude, sine, 
If you think about it, if you're talking about unit vectors, the magnitudes are simple. They're just going to be one. In addition, what are the unit vectors? They're by definition orthogonal to one another. That's what allows them to form a basis in three-dimensional Cartesian space. So if you just use your right hand rule, and it's a good thing to go through and make sure you can do it. Notice if you put the base of your right hand along the positive x-axis and you curl towards the y-axis, your thumb points in the positive z direction. So i cross j is k. If you repeat that, what you'll see is you kind of have this circular, uh, and again, the circular in the counterclockwise positive, easy to remember because that's our convention of moments, of how you compute cross products of unit vectors, i cross j, k, j cross k, i. If you don't move in the counterclockwise direction, if you move in the clockwise direction, it's the same pattern, it's just that the, the unit vectors are negated. So just to show you how to use that, k cross j would be negative i, i cross k would be negative j. So um, hopefully that's pretty intuitive to you. So we're generally not going to be taking cross products of unit vectors, we're going to be taking cross products of vectors that uh, have some type of rectangular uh, form description where they have i hat, j hat, and k hat components. And kind of the mathematical technique that we can use in order to compute these by hand, it's what's known as a cofactor expansion of a matrix. So if I formulate a matrix where the second and third row are the components of the two vectors which I'm taking the cross product of, A and B, and in the top row, I have the unit vectors, I hat, J hat, and K hat. What we notice is if I do a cofactor expansion along every column, basically, and the first row. So I don't want to go into too much detail. You'll see this in more detail when you get to linear algebra. But um, for computing the i-hat component, I do a cofactor expansion along the first column and the first row. That's why these have lines through them. And that actually reduces the determinant computation to a two by two. And that's kind of why I showed you Kramer's rule in chapter three, even though the book didn't show it. So I could kind of introduce the idea of a determinant. Remember when you take a determinant of a two by two system, that it's the product of the downward diagonal minus the product of the upper. The only thing you have to be careful about when you do a cofactor expansion in order to compute a determinant is uh, when you go from first column to second column, you have to add a negative sign in there. And this is true for, for any technique that you would use in linear algebra. So that's why the book has this, remember the negative sign. That's just a rule that comes from the definition of uh, computing the determinant of, in this case, a three by three matrix. So it's just, just something that we have to remember. So let's do an example problem here. We're given uh, two vectors, A, one, two, zero, meaning it lives totally in the XY plane, and B, negative one, three, zero. And we want to compute A cross B using that cofactor expansion. And then uh, ask ourselves, do does our result match our physical intuition? So let's see how that would work. So the way that we actually um, compute the cross product is to make our three by three matrix that we're going to take the determinant of. In the first row, put the unit vectors, i hat, j hat, and k hat. In the second row, put the components of A. In the third row, put the components of B. Now, the reason that they're ordered this way is this is A cross B. If it was B cross A, I would flip the two. Now, what I'm going to do is a cofactor expansion. I'm going to cross out the first column in the first row, and I'm going to say that I'm going to get the i-hat component by taking the determinant of the 2 by 2 system that's left, 2, 0, 3, 0. And then remember, when I go to the second column, I'm going to put a minus sign in here, and I'll determine the j component by taking the cross product of the matrix that's left when I eliminate the first row and second column. So that will be 1, 0, minus 1, 0. And then finally, plus k hat, I will eliminate the third column and first row. And the two by two matrix that I need to compute is one, two, minus one, three. So I got three two by two determinants. I do these determinants by taking the product on the downward direction minus the product on the upward direction. What do you notice here? Two times zero minus zero times three. This is just going to be zero. So the i hat component will be zero. J hat component, same thing, right? zero minus zero. So what that shows me is that my vector will only have a k hat component. What will be that k hat component? One times three is three minus two times minus one is minus two. So this will just be five k hat. So what this tells me is that a cross b is only in the uh, k hat 
direction. And remember that k hat means along the z-axis. And why is that? Well, we can see really simply if we sketch the usual coordinate system that, uh, as it's shown in the book, and this is our x-axis, and this is our y-axis, where would the vector um, x component of 1, y component of 2 live? It's going to be in the plane kind of over here. And where would the, so this is our a, and where would b live? Minus 1, and uh, y component of 3, so it's kind of going to be over here. If we think about a cross b living in the plane of the paper, if I take a cross product of a cross b, it's going to be purely in the z direction. And in this case, right, these are not uh, purely perpendicular, but they do have good angular separation between them. So I'm not surprised that the, um, the cross product is not trivial, right, compared to the magnitudes of the two vectors individually. And there's a lot of different ways you can kind of build more intuition, but the key point there is that this does match your intuition if two vectors in the xy plane then cross product is directed along k hat. So hopefully that was a good uh, refresher for you or maybe an uh, introduction for the first time seeing it, but uh, we'll move on and actually apply the cross products in mechanics next.